5,000 years ago, we, as a species, developed writing. The ability to replace complex images with abstract and concise chains of multifunctional symbols. And millennia later, we discovered that by using the combined forces of technology's deft industry and humanity's boundless creativity, we could warp these formidable characters until... Well, until they look a little bit like a... Like a funny little boat. And thus, ASCII art was born. And boy, can you do some fun stuff with it, such as making Sid from Ice Age, making words out of parts of words which are definitely not words, creating this haunting visage of Wallace and Gromit, and perhaps most commonly, representing the entire interface of a Lovecraftian roguelike horror fantasy game that utilizes classic tabletop RPG mechanics to convey hopelessness and tension while also keeping a huge amount of player agency. And my favorite of this immense genre is potentially Rogue Legends Dark Realms, or simply RLDR. Last episode I said, I'm a huge fan of these things, so this game is already orgasmic, but I'll set that bias aside and jump on in. Firstly, we must build our hero. Starting with race, we're given the choice of human, hobbit, elf, dwarf, and the correct choice. Then we choose a class, and I of course take peasant, as I don't really feel qualified to take anything else. And here we are, this happy little face is us, the goblin peasant of yore that I shall christen Grongable Spunt. We begin by finding a poison potion and a flame potion, and naturally, to prove my mettle, I drink both. And that's the end of Grongable Spunt. Let's try again. I refuse to give up on the goblin race, but I'm not gonna pick peasant this time. First, I'm going to read about it, and then pick peasant. We get a rusted pitchfork, rags, extremely high misery, and it's very hard for beginners. If someone described me like this, I would be furious. My pitchfork is immaculate when my underlings behave. Starting this again, I realize something. A lot of the screen simply does not exist. This is for a reason. As you explore more, more is revealed. And in terms of gameplay, that works really well. But I know you. Yeah, you. If you see a lot of not much, you're going to click away. So here's a compromise. The game stays as it is, but I'll add some background footage for some extra flavor. Everybody wins. For real though, I really enjoy this game's interface, and you may be put off by the amount of empty space at play, but honestly, while playing, you don't really notice it. You ever watch a let's play or a stream where the person streaming slash let's playing doesn't notice something that's super obvious, but all of the chat and or comments point it out? That's because viewing a game and playing a game are massively different visual experiences. At least, that's my excuse. So don't let the game's apparent visual simplicity put you off. As a user, it's excellent. While I was talking there, my second goblin peasant perished. To a misty thing. Rest well, Siglin Forsp. Time to make a new character. Round three. I'm thinking, goblin peasant. Let's get wild, Breel Neen. While playing as Breel Neen, I realized that every item that you pick up, including weapons, armor, notes, corpses, and so on, can be eaten. I regret to inform you that Breel Neen has choked to death on his own rags. His son, Nukla V. Fuckwit, will surely avenge him. As much as it is a strange choice to allow the player to eat, throw, examine, destroy, or otherwise interact with seemingly random items, I... I do like it. It's embracing the freedom offered by tabletop RPGs, complete with the absolute redundancy of many of the actions. The freedom to choose and the freedom to choose correctly are two vastly different things. I say, while attempting to eat a pitchfork. Now, you may notice that I've been dying more than an overzealous hairstylist, and this is for a few reasons. Firstly, it's because I'm bad. Secondly, it's because I keep picking goblin peasant over, let's say, a dwarf inquisitor or elf demon cultist. Thirdly, the game is hard, though that may mostly be due to point number two. And finally, I'm playing it quickly. This is where the game deviates from typical tabletop RPG gameplay, as you can play it at basically any pace you want. Now some of you will say, Painticus, you knowledgeless buffoon, I run a tabletop RPG and I allow my players to play as quickly or as slowly as they want. To which I would say, reevaluate and ask yourself, could this gameplay ever be less slow? In the time it takes one player to decide on doing one basic attack on a low-level kobold for the sixth turn in a row, RLDR could have already have you exploring the deaths of three to five goblin peasants. Alternatively, you could have spent that time reading these provocative and well-written notes. As you can probably tell from the footage in the background, I tend to play roguelikes in a pretty speedy fashion. High risk, high reward. But instead of high reward, there's just a inescapable feeling of time controlling my entire life. And while RLDR supports this, I'm also very bad at the game, so I've died countless times on the first three levels. 
It's at this point I stopped naming my goblins. They stopped being heroes and started being statistics. If you're more patient than I am, however, chances are you'll find much more of the game much faster than I did. Another thing that contributed to my growing body count is the unpredictability of it all, which makes it much harder for the police to track you. So, uh, wait, hang on, that's the wrong... that's the wrong script. Another thing that contributed to my growing goblin body count is the unpredictability of it all, as the game is very much randomized, from map layouts to player stats to ability checks and combat effectiveness. Smarter players than I would pay attention to the frankly incredible amount of information that the game provides about items and enemies and so on in order to use this randomized element of the game to their advantage, but I... I'm not smart. So I just click things. And I die. And I have fun anyway. I was originally going to include this alongside the other procedurally generated horror games in that video, but this has too much stuff to discuss. It's too unique, which has unfortunately been the downfall of many a great series, but not this one, because it's in very active development. Very active development. Since beginning this script and video preparation, there have been eight or so updates. That's eight in like a month. So this definitely isn't one of those abandoned early access games. Now, I did mention that this is a horror game and yeah, it is. Much more so in a thematic sense than any kind of visceral horror. Most of the horror comes from notes, descriptions, the survival mechanics, and the low visibility, but there's definitely a deeper, more unique kind of fear to this. I don't know about you, but there is something especially disquieting about this game's aesthetics. Let me get rid of Bubsy for a moment. It may just be years of conditioning due to mysteries such as Polybius and various game creepypastas, but the look of the more esoteric retro games makes me quite uneasy. Is it the stillness, the vagueness, the age, the obscurity? Who knows? But it adds a real aura of a cursed game, and I'm all for that. Another factor for that could be the screaming crates. After some time, I gave up on the goblin peasant fantasy and started to look for other classes to play. And that's when I noticed, wow, there's more than one. And also, wow, there is much more to this game than I initially thought. As you see, not only does every class have its own stats, equipment, and lore, but they also have their own objective. For example, rogues are trying to collect a certain amount of gold, librarian apprentices are searching for the king in yellow, um, I mean, the red king, cultists are trying to find powerful artifacts, and peasants are simply trying not to unleash their immense power. But not only that, some classes have their own special allegiances. For example, one of the game's most dangerous enemies is called a Realmling, and believe me, they've claimed more goblin lives than a fantasy insurance fraudster. But if you're a realm child cultist, they're your mates. You're as thick as thieves. Except not thieves, because rogues exist, and they're not friendly. And this drastically changes the gameplay in certain areas. Like here, when I just vibed with a pack of other realm boys, when with any other class I'd be torn into more pieces than an infinite jigsaw. And I can't tell you what other intricacies the classes have, because, as I mentioned earlier, the game is constantly being updated with new mechanics, endings, objectives, and so on. So there's definitely more to come, including an actual win condition for the glorious peasant master race that's been left out so far. One thing that I'm contractually obligated to mention is that this game is very clearly Lovecraft-inspired, if the several playable cultists hadn't informed you of this. It's more fantasy than Lovecraft's more popular works, but even he wrote some pretty bizarre stuff every so often. And it's got everything you'd expect. Cultists worshipping things that can only be spelled accidentally, people going mad because they tried to think too hard, gods that don't really care about anything, wacky statues, and even wackier gremlins. My favourite Lovecrafty event that transpired was when some ominous music started playing and odd inhuman dancers appeared from the walls in a haze of confusion. But I'd charmed a little Gronton earlier in the level, and he just annihilated every single one of them. It reminded me of the Dunwich Horror, where the second biggest threat to humanity was killed by somebody's dog. Not all Lovecraftian beings are deathless deities of insurmountable power. Sometimes they get absolutely trounced. Often by a pet. So far I've had loads of fun with RLDR, even if I am terrible at it, and really haven't gotten very far, and I would definitely recommend that you play it if you're even slightly intrigued. Therefore, I'll rank it as great. Keep in mind that it's still in development though, so not everything's been completely fleshed out so far. With that in mind, I have two gripes with the game that I'd love to see improved in future updates. Firstly, feedback. Now, admittedly, this is partially due to the fact that I often rush through these kinds of games, but many times while playing, I've had major events happen without any real indication that they had actually happened. For example, I'll be walking around and suddenly notice that my health has dropped dramatically, or that I'd been poisoned or set on fire, or something like that. Several of my deaths were caused by this going unnoticed, because I was focusing on the map rather than my vitals. A more prominent sound or visual effect when combat starts would go a long way to fix this. And for more meticulous players, this won't be as much of a problem as it is for me, so maybe it's not a big deal. Secondly, insta-death mechanics. 
The only time I got annoyed at the game was when I tried to move a fountain so I could progress, and it randomly decided to deal damage and kill me from max HP. I don't know why that happened, but it did. Less of that would be tip-top. But aside from those two things, I've adored the game so far, and I'm excited to see where it goes from here. If you want to play the game or follow its development yourself, go to untrustedlife.com where you'll be able to find the developer's Twitter, Patreon, and download links for the game. And with that, I'd like to thank you all so much for watching. You can follow me on the links on screen, including Patreon, where, for whatever reason, you can donate to me and get stuff like early access to videos, polls, behind-the-scenes stuff, and soon, a new Patreon-exclusive series. You could even join the much-appreciated and greatly feared Council of Four, made up by iHasID, the face of the operation, for without them, we simply would not have ID, the Teeps, very much the muscle, looks, comic relief, and wild card of the group. I am deathly afraid of you. Also, this guy, who I shall call the Interloper, who appears to be the Council's very own cognito hazard, as since seeing him I have not been able to sleep, blink, or feel pain. And finally, Ernst the Ace, the Shadow Master at the top of the Order who controls our lives like the dark puppet master that he is. I would ask God to save us, but I am afraid to speak out. Anyway, that's all. Thanks very much. Bye.